As I look outside, I see the uh, sun is shining. Well, I can't see the sun, but I know it's shining because it's bright. So um, we're going to be having a meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I hope you can make it. Bring along your lawn, chair, uh, lawn chairs, and we'll have a good time of fellowship and, uh, and uh, testimony time and uh, singing. And good to have you come, and we look forward to having a great time together. And uh, we're going to sing our first song here right now, and it's Since I Have Been Redeemed. Get my glasses on. song we're going to sing he keeps me singing there's within my heart a melody jesus whispers sweet and low fear not i am with thee peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow here we go there's within my heart a melody jesus whispers sweet and singing. Let's just have a word of prayer before we continue. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of meeting together, and we thank you for your love to us. Christ died on the cross for our sins, that we might have eternal life, and uh, so many, uh, we've accepted him, and those that have, you know where we're going, going to a place he's prepared for us. 
So uh, we pray you'd be with us in our service today. Pray, pray for those that are not doing, uh, not, uh, not doing well physically, and we pray for your healing of the body there, and just uh, be a comfort, we pray. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen. I'm going to call on Derek for the Bible reading right now, and it's found in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. That's Acts chapter 1, 1 verse, uh, verse 1 through 11. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appeared to them over a period of forty days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, it at this time... Is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed his own, by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things... He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Thank you, Derek, for that uh, Bible reading. I'm going to sing a song uh, we haven't sung in a long time, but uh, one of my favorite choruses. And those that know what it is, you know it is number four. Maybe some people have said four. Number four, Amazing Love. So we're going to sing that song at chorus right now, amazing love. <laughs> I said, heard somebody said they want to sing that one again. So let's see if we can do that. Amazing love. And I did, 
Our hearing isn't as good as it should be, but I thought I heard that. <clears throat> or maybe it wasn't my thoughts. Let's sing that together. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. One more chorus, Therefore with Joy. And that's the title of the song, the chorus. We're going to have that right now. Just want to tell you I'm thankful for all that you have done for me, how you picked up a sinner and made him your son. Here we go. Just want to tell you I'm thankful for all that you have done, how you picked up a sinner. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord. Not my will, but thine be done, that the fullness of the sun. Thank you for your singing, uh, wherever you are doing, uh, just watching this. appreciate that. We're going to have our, uh, our speaker right now. Scott, once again, MacArthur is with us once again, and we've appreciated his ministry a uh, number three times, and uh, he's with us here again. And uh, Tammy, his wife, is along, and uh, Landon, their son, has uh, come along as well, so we appreciate them. And uh, come on up here, Scott, and minister God's word to our hearts. Lord bless you. Well, thank you, Wayne. It is good to be here once again, <clears throat> and a uh, happy Lord's Day to all of you. I trust that you do have the uh, book of Acts still open before you, Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at one specific verse out of here, keying in on that. But before we get there, we need to pause and pray, and we'll ask for the Lord's blessing over our time in his word this morning. Lord, we do thank you for this Lord's Day. We do thank you for your grace, for your mercy that you are a God who is so willing to, to give us that grace and mercy, to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we ask for that cleansing power of your spirit now to wash over us, to help us, to focus on your word during this time, that you would encourage us, and that you would strengthen us and enable us, equip us to, to be able to take the message of your gospel into this community 
and beyond. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us, you'd give us strength, and guide us now by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it seems every week I'm talking about the trip that I took to Israel several years ago, and I do want to start with that again, because during that trip, something I was with 30 other pastors, and every single well, almost every site that we went to, a different pastor would give a short devotional relevant to the particular place that we might be. Now, some of those uh, locations weren't as glamorous as others. Sometimes it was on a bus when we were traveling along. Sometimes we would be parked at the side of the road just taking a break, and someone would give a devotional there. But when my particular turn came up, I got to give the devotional to these other pastors at the location where Jesus is described here in Acts chapter 1, on the Mount of Olives. So that was a great, one of the greatest thrills of my life, and I'm fortunate to have a picture of that that somebody else took of me during that particular time, and I, I still have that picture, and have Tammy had that framed for me, and I have it on a wall in our house, and it's a great, great memory. And what I was able to share with those pastors during that time, I'm going to share with you in a, in a minute, but first... As we look at, uh, at the book of Acts here, the book of Acts is so extremely unique in our Bible. It's really a bridge between the Gospels and into the, the epistles that we have, into Romans and the rest of the epistles. And it's a bridge between the ministry of Jesus and then the ministry of the apostles and how the gospel spreads um, to the ends of the earth during that time. And the book of Acts is the second book written by Dr. Luke. Of course, he wrote the book of Luke. And in both of those, he has an inscription. It's a dedication to this man named Theophilus. Now, who is that? We don't really know him other than those two references. But he appears to be someone who, who funded the research that Dr. Luke was doing and on as he followed and traveled around with the Apostle Paul and others. And so it's a, it's a really good account for us. It's a fast-paced an exciting account of the early church and the establishment of the early church during that time. And another reason why I love the book of Acts is because it takes people like Peter, who is a failure, like Matthew the tax collector, who is despised. He takes these men and uses them, and the gospel is able to triumph through them. And God uses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. And so I don't know about you, but I'm often feeling very, very weak. And so I can take great encouragement that God uses the weak of this world to accomplish his purposes. It's a good encouragement. If we think about it, we think about the disciples. Were these men who were up to such a task to be able to carry the gospel uh, along and to advance the gospel? No, they weren't, right? For the most part, they were uneducated men that God called, that Jesus called, and said, follow me, and they followed. And then they were told to wait and you're going to be endued with power from on high to advance the gospel. The Holy Spirit is going to come. So these men were really failures. They were failures in public. They were failures in private. They denied the Lord Jesus Christ. They abandoned him in, the, in his time when he needed them. They took off, and Jesus was murdered, and they were standing by and uh, on the sidelines. And on and on we could go about uh, the apostles, but they... Uh, they did not have the understanding to fulfill the Great Commission. They didn't have the ability, the power to fulfill the Great Commission. And here Jesus reiterates the promise that he made previously, and that is the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would empower them for the work uh, to accomplish this work that Jesus had, had started for them. And another great reason to read and study the book of Acts is because it pushes us beyond our comfort zone. It pushes us beyond the boundaries of, of, uh, of ethnicity and beyond the boundaries of the walls of this church and into the community. It's another great reason to love the book of Acts as we see that these believers in the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to reach the world for Christ because of the Holy Spirit's power within them. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. And so the text before us today records some of the final earthly words of the Lord Jesus. And so he hasn't returned yet. And so the mission that he gave them at that point in time remains the mission that we have for us today 
to reach the world for Christ with the gospel. And so he gives us the mission. And verse 8 is key. It's a key verse in the book of Acts. It's the key uh, turning point in the book. And really, the way that the book is framed, if you were to chop up the book of Acts, you would see that verse 8 there, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The pattern for the entire book of Acts is tailored around that one verse. If you were to chop up the book of Acts, you would see that chapters 1 through 7 tell of the witness in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 to 11, the witness in all Judea and Samaria. And then chapters 12 to 28, the witness to the ends of the earth. That is the entire outline of the book of Acts. But for our purposes this morning, I just want to look at one verse, and that is verse 8. And our outline is going to be the mission, the mission's extent, and the mission's power. So let's deal first with that first point, the mission. Verse 8, you will be my witnesses. That is the calling for all of us as Christians. That is the calling for every Christian church. You will be my witnesses. And and that word witnesses or witness occurs 39 times in the book of Acts. And so it's a very important thing. It's to be witnesses simply means to share the good news of the gospel. That's what we are called to do, to share the good news. And this is something that has fallen on hard times in many Christian churches. If you were to look at the budget of many churches and then to look at those line items concerning missions and evangelism and discipleship, those kind of ideas, often you will see that there is, there is something of a deficit there where foreign missions might be given to, but local missions, evangelism is often something that is pushed aside and we're not focusing on as much as we ought to. And the Lord Jesus here gives us that call to be missionaries, each and every one of us. Locally, as a local church, we're supposed to be doing that in outreach. And then even as individuals in our workplace, at school, wherever it might be, we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to make it a priority. The mission is still the mission. We've got good news for a world that is in chaos and turmoil. And so we are saved by grace alone. And that is the message that we are supposed to be spreading We don't have an organization that you have to join like the Jehovah's Witnesses. You don't have fancy underwear that you have to wear to be one of us like the Mormons have to do. Um, You don't have to have a mixture of works and grace in order to be like the Roman Catholics do, in order to be uh, saved, in order to um, have eternal life. All of these false systems and false gospels cannot compare, cannot match the wonder of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is free grace that he offers, that he gives to us. It's free grace. And so we can thank the Lord Jesus Christ for that, that he paid the penalty and price for our sins to enable us to simply believe by faith, by grace, that we can have this wonderful salvation that is free for us. And so the message might be very, very simple. But often in the local church, us fulfilling that mission um, can be complicated, but it's a very, very simple message that we deal with. And so we have some of the uh, last words that are keyed in on uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ here in this first chapter of Acts. And last night I was just kind of doing a little quick search, a Google search of last words from some famous Christians that you might know. And These are the last words of John Knox, the famous reformer from the 1500s. Live in Christ, die in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. And Richard Baxter, a a reformed and Puritan pastor, he said, I have pain, but I have peace. I have peace. And then someone asked him, how are you? And he said, almost well. I love that. Almost well. He knew that he was getting close to the finish line and he knew that he would be a lot better than he's ever been when he crossed that line. And so these are good, encouraging words for us to see that not only can we live well as Christians, we can also die well 
as Christians when we have our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here some of the last words of Jesus. You will be my witnesses. That is the mission. But where are we supposed to do that? Well, Jesus gives us that answer as well. The mission's extent. Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Here is the place we ought to fulfill our calling. And quite simply, it's everywhere. Everywhere. At home, abroad, in our community, in our workplace, everywhere. That's where we're supposed to fulfill this a great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ and these directives that he gives to, to the disciples, to the apostles at this time. Now, these words are very, very familiar to us. We've all, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know the great commission in Matthew 28. You know these words that he's given to the disciples here, and they're very, very familiar to us. But these thoughts, these ideas would not be familiar to the disciples. Now, why would that be? Well, Jerusalem... Well, there's a lot of hostility there towards them, isn't there? They've just uh, seen Jesus killed there. And so we think of Jerusalem. Well, that's, that's a pretty hard task. Judea, well, they've been many times rejected in Judea. And so that's another hard task. And then Samaria, we're called to minister to them. No, we're supposed to be avoiding them, aren't we? That's what they were taught. That's what they grew up. They weren't supposed to go near them. And same thing for the Gentiles. To the ends of the earth, we're supposed to go to the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles were dogs to the Jews. They were unclean to the Jews. They weren't supposed to have anything to do with them either. So these things that are so familiar to us would not be familiar to them, would not be something that was uh, on their radar screen, screens as well. They didn't grow up that way. They didn't think that way. But yet Jesus changes all of that and says the gospel is not only for Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. It's supposed to go to the ends of the earth. And such has always been the case for followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ grips you with that free grace, your desire is to see others come in contact with that free grace as well. And it's something that we want to take to our local community as well. Now, when we think about foreign missions, that can be very easy for us, right? We can write a check. We can see someone who's doing ministry in a foreign land, and we could say, boy, that is, that's a very worthwhile thing, and we can write a check. But that's often the most easy thing to do, isn't it? There's no real emotional investment. There's no real time investment. And sure, we can pray for them. That's something of an investment. And we can give some of our money to them. But the harder thing is to reach out to our families, to the neighborhood around this church. And those types of ideas can be much harder to fulfill. And we can be all in favor of giving to these international ministries and ministries abroad in Canada, but we need to be doing our part also in our local communities. And we know that it's a great call and it's a call to put aside our ease and our comfort and to be stretched outside of our comfort zone to be able to advance the gospel. Now, when we think about these people in the early church, missionary biographies and all of these different things, their idea was not to, okay, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to retire at 55, and I'm going to die on a golf course down in Phoenix. That wasn't the plan, was it? When we look at the establishment of the early church and even some of the people that we might know who've gone to foreign lands, who've given their life for the gospel, who've moved away from family, from children sometimes, and had all sorts of hardship, ease and comfort was not something that they were looking for. They were simply wanted to be obedient to the Lord's command and to see the gospel extended throughout uh, wherever God had called them to do. And so it is not easy and we see examples of how people are obedient. And we can see even, even in the apostles, the hardships that they endured. And, and I have a quick list here. I'll just go through it very quickly of the end of some of these eminent apostles that we read about in our New Testament. Well, we look at Matthew. His end, he suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword. Mark, he died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city. Luke, who authored the book of Acts, he was hanged upon an olive tree in the land of Greece. 
Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was thrown from a pinnacle on the Temple Mount, thrown down uh, many feet below, and then was attacked by an angry mob with clubs and clubbed to death. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was speared to death. There's irony in that, isn't it? If you think of the life of Thomas and his interactions with Jesus, he was speared to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. And the Apostle Paul, through various trials, persecutions, was event eventually beheaded in Rome. It's quite a list, isn't it? And when we think about the Apostle Paul, what did he say about death? To live as Christ and to die as gain. And I think often in our North American church culture, we do not view dying as gain. Now that's a completely another sermon, and we'll move on. But whether we live, whether we have health, through sickness, through poverty, through hardships, whatever it is, our deepest desire must be to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to please him. And what does he want? Well, verse 8, you will be my witnesses. That's what he wants. That's what the apostles did and were to do likewise. That is the call for all of us as Christians. But that is also a great privilege. I don't know about you, but when you share the gospel with someone, doesn't that just thrill you? You come away going, boy, that was, that was exciting. What a privilege it is to be able to share the gospel with someone. But when we look at all these hardships, we can think, boy, that is, that is a task I don't think that I'm up for. I don't think that I can do that. And perhaps the disciples thought that as well. And so what does Jesus do? He says, no, you can't do it, but I'm going to give you power to do it. And that's the same offer that he gives to us. We have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord Jesus says, gives us the mission's power in verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will receive power to enable you to witness. He will give you the words to say when we don't feel adequate to say it. Now, there is a brief interlude here of about 10 days between this coming power of the Holy Spirit and the time that Jesus utter, uttered these words. And they were told to wait in Jerusalem. The apostles were to wait, but then after those 10 days, the Holy Spirit came. There were tongues of fire. They spoke in other known languages or people could hear. The disciples didn't know the language, but there were people from all nations there being able to hear uh, the gospel being preached in their own language. And the Spirit went forward with great power through the apostle Peter, and he preached, and 3,000 people from many different nations were able to um, give their lives to the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ at that particular time. So this spiritual power, God displays when and where he wills. The Holy Spirit moves when and where he wills. And by having the indwelling Holy Spirit within us, we know that he wills and wants to use us in the accomplishment of this task. We ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you think of that idea of filling, it's like a pouring into, right? But So we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because we leak. We're leaky. And so we constantly need to go back and be asking for the Lord to fill us with that power. And so there are a lot of Christians who are uncomfortable with evangelism. They don't feel adequate for the task. They don't feel prepared for the task. And we often feel, don't feel like we have that built into us. There are some Christians that we see, that we observe, that have that gift of evangelism. It's a very natural thing for them. It's a part of their DNA. It's just the way that they are. It seems they have all these opportunities to share, and it comes so easy for them. Others of us don't have that, right? We might not have the gift of evangelism, but we're all called to be evangelists in a sense, okay? So we're all supposed to do that, even though it might be difficult, and we need to, we're going to come to a couple of points of application here in a bit that can help us along in our witnessing. But we can have confidence because God says that we will have that power of the Holy Spirit working in us when we are witnesses of him. We're called to plant 
the good seed of the gospel. Now, we plant, others come along and water, and we hope that in time that person will give their life for Christ. You'll recall last week I brought that red Bible with me, and that man, Cord de Graff, planted that seed of the gospel. Over the course of several years, others watered that seed, and eventually I gave my life to Christ years later. Now, do you realize that God is preparing people in your sphere of influence, your people at work, your people at the park, wherever you are, God is preparing people for you to witness to that he wants to see come. He is preparing those people and giving us an incredible opportunity. And when we look around at the neighborhood of this church, the mission field, the international mission field has come right to us, hasn't it? We look at our neighbors around this church. Many, many different nationalities are coming here. The mission field is right here. Many nations all around, and many come here wanting to know what we believe about God, about the afterlife, about spiritual things. I I can recall uh, uh, more than a decade ago, I was finishing up full-time my seminary degree, and I was at home, and my son, Landon, who's here with us this morning, he... Uh, grew out of the bed that he was in at that time. And so we put the bed up on Craigslist, and this lady who was very recent from China came here looking for, came, uh, answered the ad, came to my house looking at this bed, and she wanted to buy it for her son. So she said that she would take it. And while I was taking it apart, she began asking me questions. You know, what do you do for work? And these kind of things in her broken English. And I was able to share with her that I'm doing seminary. And she just kept asking question after question. Well, what's seminary? What's that? What do you believe about God? And all these different questions. And it was just a hole big enough to drive a truck through to share the gospel. And I did that with her. And I asked her if she wanted to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And we knelt right there in my son's bedroom. And she received the Lord as her Savior during that time. So God had prepared her to be able to, to hear the gospel. She was ready. She, she wanted to know God, and it was a great, exciting time. And there are people all around us that God is preparing to hear the gospel. We need to be open to the Holy Spirit. We need to be um, answering those promptings that we get to share the gospel. We need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel and that God would prepare our way in the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. God can soften those hard hearts. God can soften those people that we think are so far away from the kingdom of God, they're never going to come. God can do that, and we need to be praying for that. You will receive power. That's the mission, to be my witnesses. That's the mission's extent everywhere, and the mission's power, the Holy Spirit. And now I have a question for you. Where is your gaze? Where are you looking? Are you looking for those opportunities? Many Christians and Christian churches are navel gazers. Have you heard of that term before, the navel gazer? Yeah, someone who's very, very insular, introspective, very selfish, very looking at themselves and can't see beyond the walls of the church. We don't want that to be said of this church. When we look at verse 9 through 11 of this passage, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus was taken up bodily. He's going to return bodily. And remember, I said in the introduction that I was able to share in that devotional with those 30 pastors. Now, what did I say to them? What was my encouragement? Well, my simple encouragement to them was this. We can gaze around this land of Israel. We can look at all these different spectacular sites, and they are spectacular. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend that you get there at some point in time. We can look at all the manuscript evidence. We can open our Bible and see exactly where these things took place. And we can see all the archaeological findings in this land here in Israel. And we can look at all the prophecies and see them fulfilled here in this land. But the whole point is not the land. The whole point is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
All of these things don't point to a land, they point to a savior. And our task is not to be smitten or to be gazing or to be focused here on this land. It's to be able to be encouraged by all these things that we see that reinforce our our biblical understanding of the Bible and then to take that home and to be able to share the good news of the gospel with people. That was my encouragement to them. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? I think a paraphrase of what the angels are saying is here. Why are you guys looking up? Get on with it. He's giving you the mission. Get going. That was what he was trying to get across to them. Now, how are we going to do that? Four quick points of application. One, get grounded. Know what the gospel is and how to share it. We can look at different ways to share the gospel, like the Romans Road. You've heard of the Romans Road before. It's just a bit of a roadmap through the book of Romans where we take key verses and are able to move people along um, through the gospel. And another way that I found that is a very, very simple outline to share the gospel is simply around these five different words. And the words are God, man, sin, Jesus, and response. That's the outline that I have in my mind when I'm sharing the gospel with people. God. Who is God? Well, we need to define who that God is because people have all kinds of ideas of God, don't they? God is, for most people, just uh, whatever their imagination creates, whatever they want him to be, that's who God is. But that's not the God of the Bible. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is is filled with his glory. So God and his transcendence, God and who he is, needs to be defined for people because that um, becomes very important we de- when we define who man is. Because man is a sinner. And the wages of sin is death. And so when we look at who God is and his transcendence, and then who we are, we're very much polarized, Right? But what the world tries to do is make those, those two things, God and man, very much closer together. Sure, God might be a little bit better than us, but not much better. Surely he's going to understand my sin. Surely when I die and stand before them, he's going to give me a free pass into heaven. But that's not the way God works. Why? Because he's holy. And we have that separation of sin, that huge wedge that is driven in. And so well, then we need to define who man is. That man is a sinner. But Jesus, we introduced the Lord Jesus Christ and how he's died for us and died for our sins. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then we move on and, and, ta- and then ask the person for a response. You know, what are you going to do with that? Will you give your life to Christ? If you die right now, what is going to happen to you in light of what we've shared Those kind of things. We need to ask the question. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The free offer of the gospel is right there for people. So that doesn't sound very complicated to share, does it? It's not very complicated. God, man, sin, Jesus response. Get a verse or two that surrounds those different ideas, those different concepts, have biblical concepts of what that means, and be able to share uh, with people. So the Romans Road, this little outline I've given, however you want to use to be able to share the gospel, we need to be grounded in how to share the gospel. So get grounded and then get growing. Grow in this. Engage people with conversations in this. Talk to people. Step out of your comfort zone. It's going to help you to grow. What happens, as any of you know who are witnessing, sometimes people have questions that you don't have the answer to off off the top of your head. And that is totally fine. Just say, "I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll do some research on that, and I'll get back to you. It's okay not to have every answer. You know, we're not walking theological encyclopedias. We, we don't have everything right at our fingertips, and that is okay. But sharing the gospel will help us to grow. And so another way that we can do this when we're again gathered as a full church is to watch for newcomers. Watch for people who are alone. A person who shows up alone usually is a person in crisis. That's often what I've found in pastoral ministry. A person who just walks in off the street, nobody knows them, no one's ever seen them, is often a person in crisis. 
And we need to go to that person. We need to love that person. We need to have teams of people that are coordinated, ready to perhaps ask that person over for lunch. We need to be very, very intentional about this and very and praying about this, that God would give us opportunities to do that. I was on a church website a couple of weeks ago, and you know when you go on a church website and you can see the reviews? I saw one of the saddest reviews I've ever seen on a church website. It's not this one. Um, thankfully, it's not this church. But this lady said, I went to this church twice. No one ever spoke to me. And I left the last time in tears. I'll never go back again. Is that not a very, very sad commentary for any local church to have that pinned to them? And I hope that it would never be said of this church. So get grounded, get growing, and then thirdly, get knowing. Sometimes we don't share the gospel because we don't feel like we have the answers. But other times, we don't share the gospel simply because we are not entranced by God and who he is. So on the one hand, we might not know the gospel. On the other hand, we might not know God in the depth that we should know God. Because when we know the God of the Bible, when we are struck by how good and how gracious he is, we want to share that with other people. We share the things that we love, don't we? Yeah, I'm a grandfather, and I love my grandson a lot. And when the other guys at work show pictures of their kids or something, I pull out a picture of my grandson and we talk about it because we love them. And you guys do that too. If we saw a great game and we're talking to people uh, who are also sports fans and we talk about that game, right? And we're all enthusiastic about it. Or if we went on a great hike and saw a great scenery and other people that are hikers and we share those uh, places that we've gone to go hiking, to see all these great things, we we share what we love. That's the point. If we're not sharing the gospel, we need to do a personal inventory. Do I really know God in the way that I should know God? And maybe we need to look into the Bible and to be looking up these different passages that will encourage us to know this God and to see the grace of this God that he's shown to us in our lives and to see those many blessings and to be able to share that with other people. And so maybe it's been a long time for you in, since you've shared the gospel. And my encouragement to you this morning is to pray about that, to pray for someone to share the gospel with, to pray for opportunities, and to do that this week, to share the gospel with at least one person this week. So get grounded, get growing, get knowing, and then lastly, get going. Remember the commissioning of that angel? Why stand here gazing up into heaven? Get going. That's the mission. Get going. Don't be a navel-gazing church or a navel-gazing individual. Get going. Realize God's call on you to be a missionary. Now, there's great urgency in this. There's great urgency because people are dying all the time, right? It's just a simple fact of life. I didn't tell you this last week, but on our way, on our drive here last week, we passed a bus stop at the corner of 248th Street and Fraser Highway, and there's an ambulance, police car there, and a man underneath a yellow tarp. He died there at some point that morning. And so very, very sad that, it's, that that's just happening all around us. We watch the news, we see these things happening, and people are dying. People in our own families are dying, and it's a, a sad reality. So we should have a lot of urgency. Um, I'll never forget the time I preached here one Sunday morning many years ago and and I was at the back door shaking hands and I shook the hand of a man who I found out had passed away uh, the next Tuesday after that um, suddenly he passed away and so that was the last sermon he ever heard that was the last church service he was ever at and so when we think about church and coming here and gathering together or watching online if you are then this is very serious business that we're doing Heaven and hell hang in the balance when we preach the word of God. It's a very, very solemn task. It's very, very serious business, the business of the church. Very serious business. And we've got to get going on it. The psalmist says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Has the Lord done a work in your life? 
Has the Lord helped you through different trials and sufferings and circumstances where you look back and you see God's hand on it? And now you see other people that might be suffering in similar ways? Well, you've got a story to share, don't you? You've got a testimony to share of God's saving work and God's uh, work in your life in these different trials. God has called us to reach out to reach out to the people that we know, to reach out to this neighborhood, to friends and to all who do not know the good news of the gospel. You can plant that seed in someone and you're not responsible for the results, but you are responsible to plant that seed. And so God gives us this incredible opportunity and Jesus is coming again. We see we're reminded that in verse 11 of this chapter. Jesus is coming again. And the question for us is, will we be found faithful in accomplishing the mission that he's given to us? That mission that has not changed. And so we've got this call to us. And regardless of the difficulties that might be confronting us, that still the mission is still the mission. And so we have the privilege of taking that gospel in the Holy Spirit's power, wherever God places us and wherever he might call us to go. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the awesome gospel that we have. And we thank you that you, who are so transcendent, who are so high and lifted up, have condescended to save sinners like us. And we know that your saving power can be at work within us and through us for the salvation of souls around us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would accomplish that. We pray that you would use us. We pray that you would help us. And we pray that you would give us that sense of urgency in sharing the gospel with all those around us. Lord, help us where we failed in this. Forgive us and help us in the future to be able to take hold of those prepared opportunities that you give to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate uh, sharing the word here this morning, and that is so true. We need to be reaching out. Uh, so many churches, they just uh, keep to themselves, but there's a lost and dying world out there, and we need to be ones that are going out there and sharing. Got a huge complex over there uh, west of uh, church there, all kinds of uh, houses, and uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they need to be uh, reached, and uh, we, can, uh, we can do something. So let's be reaching out. And the song that uh, is uh, chosen here is uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And so we're going to sing that song. And it's a song, of course, about going and telling people about Christ. And uh, so very important. That's what we're here, we're here for. Go and share the good news. <clears throat>
once Christ is born. And let's be doing that this week. Be sharing with others the salvation that we have. Don't keep it to ourselves. Let's share it with others. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, looking forward to the meeting at, uh, this afternoon, 3 o'clock. And uh, trust that you'll be able to join us then. Thank you. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you for the uh, reminder. We need to be reaching out. We need to be sharing with others. So uh, work through us, we pray, in this, in this following week ahead. And may uh, others be reached by the witness we have. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Hope to see you this afternoon.